Good morning. Uh, the topic that I'm going to talk about is what happens when you raise taxes to the highest degree you can practically. Uh, you've cut your cost as much as you believe you can without losing taxpayers, corporate and individual. And you've reduced services to a level where it becomes questionable. Uh, how do you solve it if there's just no room left in the legal ways of doing it and on a consensual basis uh, you can't get there consensually? And I want to start by saying, number one, obviously, consensual resolution is the best. Secondly, uh, we need to foster the full payment of pensions, the raising of taxes, and dealing with balanced budgets. Uh, but we cannot wind up with the fear of crowding out essential services. We saw from Detroit over their period of time prior to going into a Chapter 9 uh, that if you raise taxes and lower services, people move out. Bridgeport, Connecticut uh, in the uh, late 80s and the beginning of the 90s suffered the same phenomena. And you go through history. And so we don't want to have the municipality fail because we didn't address the problem. The second purpose of the paper is to make sure that if we have a problem today, address it today. Don't worry about tomorrow or the next day because it may only get worse. And so we need to, to address it. Now, first of all, we have 4,000 pension funds. I'm not saying all of them or a whole majority of them may need some of these solutions, but there are clearly some. Uh, and in various states, because of economic legacy costs, businesses moving out, uh, changes in the economy, there are going to be needs for ways of solving it other than having the municipality melt. Uh, credit analysts, uh, when surveyed, when they asked what is the biggest concern they have, 92% mentioned the pension issues uh, as that. Uh, there's been all sorts of reform done. Over 40-some states have done pension reforms in the recent history. There have been litigation, and about 80% of the litigation has turned out to allow some form of adjustment. It has to be reasonable and rational. It has to be proportional, uh, but they have allowed it. Uh, so that there is a movement, and many of the states are solving it. So often we talk about, and if you talk to mayors, the last thing they want to do is go into a Chapter 9. They don't want to be the mayor that put the city in. Uh, you know, the other remedies that you have are always difficult uh, to talk about. Uh, but one of the things that, that mayors and other state officials seem to like is, can we have some federal court can deal with pension funds to get them in the right mode? And can we deal with funding our essential services? That seems more acceptable to them than putting the whole city in. Uh, oversight, which you've heard, and obviously uh, uh, Mayor Broden uh, was a good example. Marm, following the footsteps of PICA and uh, MAC and uh, control boards, uh, is a good example of supervision can lead to a, a solution. But sometimes you need something more, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, you know, we've talked about the reforms and, you know, sometimes people say, is there really a need? Uh, I think if you go about the country, you're going to find in a number of the states a real need for something more, something that is beyond where we are legally uh, today. Uh, there are some interesting movements. You know, in Illinois, obviously, people bring up Illinois, but part of the, part of the problem is, and it isn't, Illinois has a lot of problems. Net migration out is 5%. Uh, in New York, it's 5.5% net migration out uh, over the last 10 years. So if you look at those numbers, it's not just pensions. It's a, a number of factors. But we've got to make sure we put it right because that cloud can have some adverse effect. Uh, the recent uh, court, Supreme Court case pending in California dealing with can we have more flexibilities? Does the California rule have room to provide flexibilities, I think is important. Because if there isn't flexibilities, then we're going to need more of these more drastic steps. And one thing I can tell you from having lived in the sort of uh, the, the back end of uh, finance, and uh, both from uh, a funding and also from uh, operations for municipalities, uh, nobody wants to be there. And sometimes you need some very clear alternatives to help people get there voluntarily. So I view some of these as, as providing for that. Unplanned Chapter 9s. Unplanned Chapter 9s don't work well. 
You heard uh, Mayor Broden talk about prepackage. The reason why is since Detroit in 2013, no city, town, village, or county, with the exception of Liber Liberty View, Kentucky, that went into Chapter 9 to renegotiate a bad trucking lease. And once it was renegotiated, got themselves out of Chapter 9 without doing a plan. The reason why, cost, expense, the uncertitude, and normally you don't like the result. So given all that, people sort of look at it and they say, look, there has to be something we can do before we get there. Uh, we've only had 680 Chapter 9s since 1937. I mean, that's not what you call a landslide. And so people use it as a last resort. I'm saying to use it as a last resort if absolutely necessary. Vallejo, the experience in Vallejo taught us one thing. It taught us that it's very important in these situations to deal with the problem. Vallejo did not deal with their pension issue. They cut their first responders basically in half. They had a budget deficit within two years after coming out of Chapter 9. And there you know, all sorts of talks about do they need to go back in. Uh, so you need to address pension issues if it is a problem. Uh, and Stockton, again, the court recognized that you can make changes to pensions. However, given the uniqueness of CalPERS and some of the outcomes, if you did do it, uh, the municipality decided not to. Detroit, they decided that the constitutional protection was not there in a Chapter 9, that in Chapter 9, the land of broken promises, uh, basically, you can basically deal with pensions uh, effectively. Now, again, for the sake of keeping our municipalities functioning, as I tell people who want to rush off and make changes to pensions, uh, if you have some grand plan that you're going to do it and cut pensions, who are you going to get to type it? You know, you need your workers under you to perform. And so it's important to do something. The best results have been working with the unions and getting a consensual deal if you can. Now, uh, willingness to pay. There should be no tolerance for unwillingness to pay. If you got the money, if you can raise taxes, if you've cut wherever you can uh, and you still have problems, this is what we're talking about. Now. The essential mission of government is provide services at an acceptable level for their people. The health, safety, and welfare of the people are the key of state and local governments. That's what the Supreme Court, our Constitution, provide. Now, what are some of the solutions? The first, and even uh, uh, Mayor Bronin talked about it, I think we've moved on. Prepackage. Why do I say prepackage? And I'll go into it. Uh, in, in description, but it's a way of quickly doing it, not lingering in, 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 in Chapter 9, which costs you time, money, and threatens the result. The creation of a special court uh, under the federal government's powers to deal with insolvent pension funds. And this would be separate and apart. It'd be specially uh, geared towards helping the pension get as, fund, get as much funding as they can, while not crowding out essential services, recognizing the state and local government need to provide for that. Uh, as far as oversight, creating similar to what we've seen with MAC, with PICA, MARM from, uh, in Connecticut, that was uh, what uh, Hartford is in now, tier three, uh, is a form of oversight. Over the years, there have been an increasing, whether it's Act 47 Pennsylvania, control boards in, in uh, New York, uh, emergency managers in uh, Michigan uh, and in Indiana, an increase in some form of oversight and providing financing. And I think providing additional sources of revenue to people who are in distress to bridge the illiquidity makes some sense. So first of all, the prepackage. And this follows what we learned from corporate bankruptcies. You know, you can go into corporate bankruptcy as a free fall. Nobody knows what it is. There's uncertainty. Everybody jockeys for position. Before you file in a prepack, you have already talked to all of your constituency. You have given them the financial information that is adequate information to make the decision. You have uh, given them a proposed restructuring, negotiated it with them, uh, have a number of people or classes of creditors that are on board, so you have acceptance of it. You have voted. You have a vote of them and an acceptance. So when you go into the Chapter 9, you wind up talking about a couple of months, three, four months at most. And you can go in with speed, with certitude, uh, from the standpoint of the workers and the uh, suppliers and the creditors, it gives them more certitude of result. It also allows you to put pressure on people who may be unwilling to make it, unreasonably unwilling to make it, 
uh, to make a concession because they know if you go into a chapter nine, you already have a class accepting it, you're gonna have a confirmation where it could be a train coming down the tracks that you'll be run over. Uh, with regard to creation of a special bankruptcy court, a special bankruptcy court would be created. There would be, it would be staffed by judges and other staff with the skill and ability in finance and negotiation with regard to unions, with regard to labor relations and pensions, and it would provide and review and approve after giving people an opportunity uh, to comment on a recovery plan proposed by the employer uh, with input, obviously, from the unions, uh, from the workers, and from other creditor constituencies. And it would be a holistic plan. It would not just be for pensions. If pensions have to be changed, obviously, it would then involve the workers and the retirees. If they don't need to be changed, um, it's just a question of reaching an agreement on a different form of payout, uh, then the court would do that. It would be part of the plan. Uh, and so the legislation would be there. Uh, then the oversight, we go through the oversight. I think you're familiar with the variations on this. This is a little more intense because there'd be uh, volunteer or voluntary resolution through mediation. Uh, there'd be a commissioner geared towards mediation, a commissioner of uh, the GORDAC to deal with information and discovery and transparency, and one that would act like the chief judge who would be the one in charge of hearings and determinations. If you can't get it done voluntarily, it turns into quasi-judicial. They determine what is sustainable and affordable. Uh, the plan has to be, the recovery plan, which is a long-term plan, has to be consistent with the, those financial determinations. And ultimately, if people don't agree to it, uh, you wind up uh, possibly using a prepackaged plan to resolve it. Uh, and the last is creating either for a constitutional amendment or a funding policy. And this basically follows some of the better practices that some of the states and local governments already follow. First of all, you have to balance your budget. And as you know, whenever we talk about balancing budget, we have most states have some provision for balancing a budget, uh, at least on the state level, and many have also on the local level. Uh, and uh, sometimes we honor it by uh, getting close, but not necessarily there. Uh, it's important to start with a balanced budget You've got to pay the actuary determined contribution. You have to use reasonable necessary modifications to the degree any modification is necessary. And this assumes raising taxes to the highest degree possible without breaking the municipality, cutting expenses to the highest degree without sacrificing services and infrastructure improvements at an acceptable level, uh, and then doing whatever adjustment may be necessary uh, to pay as much as you can on pensions, but keep the balanced budget and keep the municipality operating. Fully funding, reasonable modifications, and if you impair any pension rights, there will be like a bond validation. You will go immediately to court for a declaratory judgment and termination as to the appropriateness. So you don't sit there and wait to get sued. It isn't a question of, of when the shoe will drop. There'll be, you have to get that determination in order to basically uh, move forward with your, with your resolution and your budget. There's uh, priorities uh, will be made. We talked about court validation. Uh, public pensions should be af affordable and sustainable. Going forward, there would be a determination that they can afford it. You just don't add benefits uh, without proving that you can do it. You have to have legislative findings about the existence of a governmental emergency. Modifications are mandated for the public good. If it's not for the public good, there's no change. Uh, any modification has to be reasonable. Uh, it has to be, uh, the impairment has to be the least impairment possible while meeting the goals or the, of, of balanced budget, et cetera. Uh, the harm uh, to the pensioners due to the modification is to, is to be outweighed by the harm suffered by the governmental entity. So if you're not addressing a public good and a public harm uh, that, that balances out that way, you're not able to make any changes. Financial credibility of the government entity is to be preserved because you need to go forward and you need to, to fund it. Any modification 
is really not an impairment because, as we, the Supreme Court said in Asbury Park, which was in New Jersey City uh, back during the Depression, if you don't have the money to pay, what is the impairment? Because realistically, there's no ability to pay, no funds to pay. So uh, there's legal basis, and you can look at the paper on that, but basically the police power to provide for the health, safety, and welfare is key, and that's where the, the strength and the importance of this come from. Uh, I won't spend any time on that. At the end of the day, the reason why we need to do these things is we can't have the government set, uh, fail because we didn't provide for essential services and infrastructure. It also hopefully helps people get on the same page. Um, it isn't labor versus employer, uh, it's everybody together. Taxpayers, workers, and retirees have the same goal, a better, stronger, economically solvent government and community is the one that's gonna be able to pay pensions. If you don't, and if you don't provide the services at an acceptable level, uh, you won't be able to pay them. And everybody suffers. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, Jim Spiato, uh, Spiato wrote the book on muni bankruptcy, literally. Um, and he's always provided really useful and interesting discussions in these conferences. This is a lengthy paper. This presentation, you know, couldn't have done it justice. I can't do it justice either. I suggest you may want to look at it. Um, but here, his thesis, the thesis in the paper, is that to satisfy public employee pension liabilities in some states and localities now threatens their very purpose, requiring legal options beyond Chapter 9, which he argues is too expensive and time-consuming. So he offers us in the paper four, and I'm going to quote here, conceptual proposals to be further refined and developed starting with prepackaged Chapter 9 and escalating ultimately to federal permission for emergency actions to strip away state constitutional protections for pensions. All are couched in a legal justification that states cannot abdicate their government power to provide essential services. Jim's premise is that public pension liabilities are unsustainable. Now, this is not a legal argument, so I feel on safe ground, and I'm not convinced. Before the two latest financial crises, public pension funds were in good shape. Indeed, Alicia Munoz's work showed us they were even overfunded. They took a hit, and they're now recovering. I like Herb Stein's law. If something can't go on forever, it's going to stop. And it has. As Jim admits and showed us, courts, legislatures, and negotiators have taken to heal what he calls the unsustainable. Since 2009, every state has made meaningful changes to their pension plan benefit structures, financing arrangements, or both. Retiree health benefits, OPEB, are generally not an entitlement. The costs are now reported on balance sheets and they're going to continue to be lowered, but not without harm to many. The standard approach to pension reform has been to reduce the employer costs starting with new employees who have no protection. In the case of existing employees, there's a variety of ways to save costs depending on the state's legal political, and bargaining environment. And even the California rule is likely to get judicial modification. Neither am I convinced that meeting pension obligations ultimately threatens budget sustainability. Nothing in his proposals brings long-term budget reforms, no mandatory multi-year financial plans, or budgeting by GAAP rather than cash. 
legislatures and governors can make these changes, and indeed, many have required them of fiscally troubled cities, which you point out and which Mayor Bronin pointed out last night. Most states have responded to the last two financial crises through mandating larger reserves and changes in tax policy, some of which Kim, uh, Kim Rubin took us through in yesterday's session. Budget numbers and pension liability calculations are not written in stone. They change at least annually with demographic and financial experience. Detroit, using a multi-year financial plan, has now transformed a looming cliff of pension liability in 2024 into a longer, gentler slope by creating a retiree protection fund into which it is annually paying budgeted revenues and reserves, and that produced a credit upgrade. Admittedly, governments cannot pay, and here I'm going to quote Jim, cannot pay what they do not have. Fortunately, they have taxing power. But in more than a few states, there's been an unwillingness, not an inability, an unwillingness to pay pension contributions. And Natalie made an allusion to that in her remarks. How do we know? We can look at the choices or the revealed preferences or the foregone revenues over time. And the new GASB 77 requirement to report the value of tax incentives offers improved transparency to some of these foregone revenues. So now we know, for example, that the annual cost of funding pensions represents only 69% of the annual cost of Kentucky's reported corporate tax subsidies, and that state is not alone. Also, in case you're not aware, there are at least 16 states where employees' state income tax withholding never gets to the tax collector. Instead, the employer keeps it as a tax break. Opaque to employees and almost everybody else, this revenue loss is happening today in Colorado, Connecticut, Illinois, Kentucky, and New Jersey, which have very troubled pension systems. Of course, these are policy choices to limit budget revenues, which makes them removable through legislative action. In addition, this paper simply ignores the dynamic nature of budgeting. A host of opportunities are going to come up to help improve longer-term fiscal balance. Today, I could tick off a source list of possible revenues, conformity or nonconformity with federal tax changes, taxing carried interest, legalization of marijuana and sports betting, the taxation of online, sa uh, online sales, changing ACA and Medicaid rules. Tomorrow, mandatory Social Security participation could save costs through benefit integration, particularly for teachers' pension systems. And always, states are seeking the consolidation of local governments for efficiencies. Finally, Jim signals out and designates pension problems as causing a government emergency. Why? Today, there are a limited number of states with accumulated debts, some of which are employee-related, that have chosen over the years not to address them. Illinois, New Jersey, Kentucky, Massachusetts and Connecticut, Oregon, California, a few others, depending on how you measure the indebtedness. Most are heavily indebted in the old-fashioned way, too, through borrowing. They have multiple political and governance issues. You know, kicking the can down the road is rarely confined to pension funding. Still, he proposes a federal bankruptcy court for insolvent pension funds, which would formally segregate employee-related debt from bonded debt. I think this is kind of forum shopping, and it makes, and to me, it is unrealistic. Practical obstacles make it unlikely to be neat, cheap, or quick. You need state legislative sign-off, you have to worry about how you're going to define fund insolvency. I mean, what degree of underfunding are you going to make the, the cut? 
There's a large number, as Natalie pointed out, of employee-related plans. They involve multiple employers, multiple employee groups, some overlapping and some quite independent, especially in higher ed. Conceptually, too, it raises the issue of moral hazard, especially given egregious non-funders. Why not just let the states find get access to Chapter 9 or some modified version, some resolution mechanism to, to settle all indebtedness in one place. Now, I suspect that if a Chapter 9 type model were pushed for dealing with all state indebtedness, bondholders wouldn't like it. They believe their claims should be satisfied first in a creditor's zero-sum game. As Jim puts it, and I quote him on page 15, in the paper, in Detroit, certain unsecured creditor groups received less than the beneficiaries of the pension plans. Well, if so, it's because almost everyone thought low and moderate income pensioners living in the community, many without social security, had a higher moral claim to protection and they would contribute to the city's recovery. In closing, I note that all of Jim's alternatives would cut pension liabilities, largely through benefit reductions, and leave bondholders unscathed. We are presented with a process that has prejudged the outcome of how the burden of adjustment in fiscally stressed states gets shared, and it falls on pensions. Pensions are deferred compensation. To cut them breaks an employment pro promise and a contract. To do so under extreme duress should require a fair and transparent process with all the assets and the liabilities open for adjustment and all concerned parties around the table. Bonded debt and financial contracts shouldn't have a free pass. Remember, even with shared participation, labor markets like financial markets are going to react to cuts in compensation. After the broken employment promises, where are we going to get the bodies, you know, the cops, the firefighters, the teachers, the social workers, and the others, to deliver the essential public services that this paper says is the core mission we're trying to protect? Just a parting thought. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. I, I appreciate your remarks. Uh, I did in the paper point out. Uh, for example, you don't need that for me. I can. Hear okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it just should be a conversation between the two of us. Uh, there are, I think, throughout the country, and I know from calls I get from issues, uh, municipalities and states that need real help. Uh, and I think back in 19. 90s and in the early 2000s, uh, it was a different situation. And even then, people talked about the problem. Uh, I am not saying that anybody wins in this. Chapter 9, everybody gets adversely affected. Uh, so if you go into a prepackaged Chapter 9, uh, you, will, you will have bondholders and everybody else at risk. So I, I'm not saying that anybody is sacred. At the same time, I am afraid, and this is something that, that I am hearing now, we can pay it, we can solve it, just give it time. We have given it time and it is now, in a number of situations, a real issue for both states and municipalities. Uh, and I, I think that we need to, to think about solutions to solve it when all else fails. Uh, yes, if you can get it done voluntarily. Uh, but, you know, if you looked at Joe Nation's study, uh, and I think the California, uh, Marin County in that, uh, there are going to be municipalities and even possibly CalSTRS uh, that have significantly low funding. And with the demographics, you're not going to have the ability to make up the difference. So transgenerationally, 
the young workers are going to get hurt. And I think also this is going to come at a time in the next uh, X number of years, whether it's within the next five or within the next two, when we're going to have an economic downturn. And the ability to address them uh, and solve it and pass legislation at that time is harder. States going into bankruptcy, I testified before Congress on that. Uh, both the National uh, Conference of State Legislatures and the National Governors Association response to uh, having states go into bankruptcy is, we don't want it, it's not necessary, and it will not help us. Uh, and, and those were not bondholders speaking, those are elected officials and state representatives. Uh, you know, uh, there, is a, there are legal and practical problems, uh, and if we start putting states as a co-sovereign to the federal government through a federal bankruptcy process, uh, the consequences of that could be worse uh, uh, than what the present problem is. I, 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 I don't think we're going to solve uh, this. I, I guess my, my feeling here is there are very practical issues that are being dealt with around the country as we speak. I am not convinced that that this is a that the scope of the problem is um, is is terrifying at this point. I think it is much better than it was, right? Be because people have recognized it and are making differences, and because the economy has gotten better. And I don't I don't doubt that there's um, at some point there will be another downturn. I, that the, I'm an, enough of an economist to know that how bad it will be. Who knows? But these, the situation, as I see it, is being solved daily. Okay, so and we're going to agree to disagree on this. Yeah, we're not going to. Um, we're not. We're not. We're not going to. We're not going to so reach wanna, an agreement. We want to get to the audience, and I, I have a few questions for Jim. Um, so, uh, one, I'll just give you all these questions. One is in the prepackaged bankruptcy, you still need agreement. From the parties, and yeah, you're not you know why is that? Uh, you know why is that not going to prolong the process as if you didn't have a prepackaged bankruptcy? Um, the second thing is towards the end of your paper when you talk about the Constitution and constitutional amendment, you talk about the uh, the, the police powers of government and that the federal contract clause has in some cases. Uh, ruled in favor of that police power to the detriment of, of creditors. And that begs the question, why in Illinois, if the Constitution precludes any sort of adjustment to pensions, that someone couldn't make that case to the Supreme Court that the state of Illinois is crowding out its ability to provide police powers? A couple of things. First of all, with regard to the prepackage, uh, yes, you do the negotiations, you get people, you cut a deal, and you get people on board. There are numerous examples of doing it on the corporate side. You can do it on the municipal side. Uh, you know, having done a lot of municipal restructurings, it's getting people to come together. All you need is one accepting class, and you can provide appropriate treatment uh, for the rest of the classes uh, and uh, have the plan confirmed. Uh, and uh, so I do not see that as an obstacle against it. And getting an accepting class is, is getting people to realize that uh, uh, in a, through a settlement process and negotiation, that negotiation goes on earlier, hopefully. And that's what you know the, the mayor talked about, and I think that's what people are coming to the conclusion, addressing these issues not right before everything fails, but when uh, you start realizing that you need to find a solution. And that's basically worked, and that's continued to work since I, since before New York 75, but it's it's been going on. I think you asked a very interesting question, though, about why somebody hasn't taken the Illinois issue to the U.S. Supreme Court on that, and I suspect it, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I suspect it's because things haven't gotten bad enough. Well, right? uh, you know, I... You, I, you still have a functioning government. Sorry. You still you have know, a functioning government. Well... If you, if you take the, the cost, uh, if you look at uh, Chembles from J.P. Morgan, if they were to pay the actuary required amount over 30 years, it would take 40 percent 
of their uh, general funds, right. which is not sustainable uh, for the state. Well, this was a question I had on, on, on your, your um, segregated um, pension bankruptcy court. You know, how, how the hell do we, what is insolvent for a pension fund, right? How do you define it? What number do you pick? Well, I mean, they're still sending out checks, so this is not a cash. This is not. What's the fiduciary duty? What's the fiduciary duty of the trustees of the pension fund? Well, and they and when you're 35 percent funded, and and they keep and, paying. and you're paying the full amount to the current retirees, and you have a diminishing uh, contribution by current employees because it's going down. And I, what you're doing is you're asking for a real crisis down the line, where the pension funds aren't going to be able to pay those younger Yes, and, that, and, and that's why you've had all the legislative actions to change the structure of benefits, to change the contribution rates both by employees and employer, all right? That's right. why you've done it, to make, so that if you keep pushing the time out, you're, what you're going to be paying out is going to be a substantially smaller amount. That, that, but so... <laughs> From a fidu I'm only I'm not I'm not saying what's right. I'm only saying from sitting because I've worn a fiduciary hat. If you're wearing a fiduciary hat, you're doing the best yeah. you're doing the best you can under those circumstances. Tier one in a lot of places isn't going to start into effect for twenty some years. Within that twenty some years, there's a lot of economic distress that is going to occur. All and right, we we uh, and we should probably not. take questions from the audience, and you yeah. can over a drink answer that question if we could if we could get to the Illinois or to the US Supreme Court yeah. would that would that work well and, and, and just because it, I mean let me just say the Attorney General did not appeal it because there wasn't presented a federal issue uh, there are people actually working on possibly creating a, a test case that will raise that that's one of the issues that can be done in Illinois okay George Hi, Mike. Uh, George Friedlander, Court Street Group. Um, one very quickie observation, then question. The, the quickie observation is that I'm kind of startled um, by the idea of, of making bondholders substantially more vulnerable in this process, which I have no doubt would dramatically increase borrowing costs for everybody, including those that don't have a problem. Um, I, I think it would be an entirely new world. My question, though, uh, starting with Jim, um, to my mind, at the at the local level, and I'm looking at this more at the local level than the, than the, than, than the state level, um, competitive competitiveness increasingly matters um, between city and city, especially with technological change being becoming so important. And that means service. That means infrastructure and the problem, uh, Jim, of, of not have, being able to audit infrastructure needs. And it means uh, technological competitiveness in, in an environment where cities that are not technologically competitive um, don't flourish. And I, I'm wondering how one puts those second and third issues into the equation in coming up with solutions. Any plan that would be proposed under any of these proposals would, uh, as you've probably seen, uh, include economic development. Uh, you noticed uh, Mayor Broden, and if you look at different things written, things I've written and other people have written, economic development is the high tide that lifts, lifts the boat. And, and uh, you know, the fact that you may be able to file a Chapter 9, I don't think should be disturbing to the market because you need a resolution. Uh, there are certain rights and, and issues that will need to be resolved there, but there's a tradition of working those things out. Carol talks about the time of, of working it out. Uh, I think you can work those things out in a prepackage so that everybody has negotiated their position. It may be that you don't even need a Chapter 9 if you can negotiate it. Uh, and if you can't negotiate it with everybody to get them on board, then you use the Chapter 9. Let's get a, the question in the back we have. 
Hi, I'm Chris Berry from the University of Chicago. First, I just want to thank both, uh, both of you for a really uh, constructive and stimulating discussion on the topic uh, over which there's obviously some, some disagreements, but this has been great. My question is uh, for Jim. You, part of your argument uh, stems from the idea that there many states or local governments have reached a point where they cannot pay more. Uh, and Carol, I think, uh, rightly raises concerns about moral hazard, that we would, many, many places would like to claim that they cannot pay more if there's some remedy that would be available to them uh, as a result. And so I wonder, how do we know when a place cannot pay more, as distinct from has chosen not to raise taxes or something? Would there be a test? And if so, what kind of test would we, would we use to distinguish those places that, that truly cannot pay more versus those where uh, they simply uh, don't have the political will uh, to, to raise taxes. How would we know? Well, and the premise in both in a, in a prepack chapter 9, uh, in a, a federal court with regard to uh, pension funds, with regard to Gordak, uh, and also with regard, there would be a, 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 because if you're impairing anybody's rights, there would be a court review of that and a determination, and so you'd have to make legislative findings and showing your ability to raise taxes, your reason why you can't raise them any further, uh, the cuts you have made in the balancing of your, your budget, and the reason why you can't do it any further. And then there would be a determination of that. So, you know, it'd be a, there is a process to make that determination and disclosure of the basic financial facts uh, and that, that all determines whether it's fair, feasible, and in the best interest of the parties. But the bottom line is that's not so easy to do. And it's done in arbitration all the time. What can the employer pay or Kind not? of get your mic on. Can the employer pay or not pay? It's, it's this one. Sorry. It's done all the time in arbitration. Not, you know, does the employer have the ability to pay or not the ability to pay? It's not easy to figure out, and it definitely is very short-term. It tends to be a very short-term calculation as opposed to a longer-term budget sustainability kind of argument. Okay. I, I apologize. We, we do need to move on to our next session, so please uh, ask, ask Jim these questions. In the Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.